Welcome back, mitochondriacs, for another episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. So we left off on this as one of the most recent slides that we looked at. This paper in particular for me was one of the first times I'd heard about these bioactive melatonin metabolites, and I wanted to go over some of those today. So in this paper, it says that we identified 6-hydroxymelatonin, this AFMK, 2-hydroxymelatonin, and 4-hydroxymelatonin. So I did a literature search and tried to figure out exactly what kind of activities those metabolites may have. So let's dive into it. So th these are all of the known melatonin metabolites, and there are many of them, but the ones that I could find that were the most prevalent within eukaryotes and within humans were about four. And it seems to be that there are two major metabolites that are biologically active, although all four of those I did find information on. So in this paper, Metabolism of, of Melatonin and Biologic Activity of Intermediates in the Melatoninergic Pathway in Human Skin Cells, it's saying that they were able to detect in human keratinocytes, melanocytes, dermal fibroblast, and melanoma cells, production of 6-hydroxymelatonin, this AFMK, 5-methoxytryptamine, 5-MT, was detected in a cell type dependent fashion. The major metabolites, 6-OH or 6-hydroxymelatonin and AFMK were produced in all cell types. And as you can see, they actually have the skin cells broken down by layer, and then they actually would stain these various cell layers looking for these particular metabolites. So one of the major metabolites is this AFMK metabolite, this N2 acetyl, N2 formal 5 methoxykinuramine, a biologic amine and melatonin metabolite functions as a potent antioxidant. It's saying this AFMK reduced 8 hydroxydeoxyguanosine or 8-OHDG formation induced by the incubation of DNA with oxidants significantly. Lipid peroxidation resulting from free radical damage to rat liver homogenates were also prevented by the addition of AFMK. The inhibitory effects of AFMK on both DNA and lipid damage appear to be dose response related. In cell culture, AFMK efficiently reduced hippocampal neuronal death induced by either hydrogen peroxide, glutamate, or amyloid. AFMK is a naturally occurring molecule with potent free radical scavenging capacity, donating two electrons per molecule, and thus may be a valuable new antioxidant, new antioxidant for preventing and treating free radical related disorders. So what this paper is actually talking about is how not only does this antioxidant work on DNA and preventing DNA damage, it also will prevent lipid peroxidation. And I can tell you there's a couple different areas where that could be extremely important. First of all, it can help protect both mitochondrial and nuclear DNA from mutation, potentially decreasing heteroplasmy rates or preventing heteroplasmy rise, maybe a better way to say it. And it could potentially have the effect on the mitochondrial inner and outer membranes, particularly cardiolipin, which is critically important to maintain mitochondrial shape. I thought it was very interesting also that when tested on brain tissue, that was basically trying to be harmed by excess hydrogen peroxide, glutamate, which is known to be a excitatory neurotransmitter that can cause damage when in excess, or amyloid plaque, AFMK decreased or mitigated the damage caused by all three of those substances. It's very astounding. In this paper titled, AFMK, a melatonin metabolite attenuates X-ray induced oxidative damage to DNA, proteins, and lipids in mice. So what it's saying is that whole body exposure of mice to X-ray radiation reduced the level of brain sulfhydryl contents, protein bound sulfhydryl, total sulfhydryl, and non-protein sulfhydryl, which were significantly protected by AFMK. Radiation induced decline in the total antioxidant capacity of plasma was significantly reversed in AFMK pretreated mice. Moreover, AFMK showed a very high level of in vitro hydroxyl radical scavenging potential, which was measured by electron spin resonance. So what these papers are essentially showing us is that, as we'll see later, melatonin is one of the most powerful antioxidants known in human physiology. But these other melatonin metabolites also have very potent and disease-preventing and disease-reversing activity in a variety of tissues when tested. Pretty cool. So one of the other very similar compounds is called AMK, 
is produced in the human epidermis and shows antiproliferative effects. Now we're talking about cancer. So what this says is these findings indicate that antiproliferative effects of AMK are not related to melanin pigmentation. In summary, we show that the, for the first time that AMK is produced endogenously in the human epidermis, that its production is affected by melanin skin pigmentation, and that AMK exhibits antiproliferative effects in cultured keratinocytes and melanoma cells. So it essentially will prevent cancer and keratinocytes, which is a type of a skin cell, and it will actually have direct anti-melanoma effects. And the next molecule is called 2-dehydroxymelatonin, a predominantly hydroxylated melatonin metabolite in plants shows anti-tumor effects against human colorectal cells. And even though this study is saying that this hydroxylated melatonin metabolite is found in plants, we saw in other papers where it's now been discovered to be in human cells as well, which is big for potential activity against human colorectal cancer cells. And what it says here is that overall, the anti-cancer activity of 2-hydroxymelatonin is more potent than that of melatonin. How crazy is that? Taken together, 2-hydroxymelatonin exhibits potent anti-cancer activity against human colorectal cancer cells via induction of apoptosis and the inhibition of EMT. So we'll talk about, you know, many of the potential mechanisms by which melatonin exerts its anti-cancer effect on at nauseam. But it's pretty cool to find that not only is melatonin very powerful against cancer, but melatonin's metabolites, in particular, this 2-hydroxymelatonin is even more potent anti-cancer effect than melatonin itself. So this paper is titled, Mitochondrial Function is Controlled by Melatonin and Its Metabolites in Vitro in Human Melanoma Cells. And what it says here is that in this study using melanotic and amelanotic melanoma cell lines, the comparative oncostatic responses, the impact on melanin content, as well as mitochondrial function controlled by melatonin, its precursor serotonin, AFMK, talked about that, 6-hydroxymelatonin, 5-MT metabolites were assessed. Namely, significant disturbances were observed in bioenergetics as follows. Uncoupling of oxphos, attenuation of glycolysis, dissipation of mitochondrial transmembrane potential, accompanied by a massive generation of reactive oxygen species and a decreased glucose uptake. Collectively, these results together with previously published reports provide a new biologic potential and make an imperative to consider using melatonin or its metabolites for complementary future treatments of melanoma-affected patients. However, these associations should be additionally investigated in clinical settings. I agree with that. But the potential here is amazing. So one of the things that you're going to see in the coming videos about melatonin is it is a potent effector of mitochondrial function. And in normal cells, it has amazing qualities of improving mitochondrial function, improving mitochondrial quality control, and acting as a potent antioxidant. However, just like for some of the other chemicals we've mentioned, in particular vitamin D, for whatever reason, when it comes to cancer, it exerts the exact opposite effect. So as it says here, uncoupling of mitochondrial oxphos, we're actually making it so the cancer cells have less energy if they're able to use mitochondria at all. It attenuates or inhibits glycolysis. That can be very useful for the Warburg effect. Dissipation of the transmembrane potential, that can, what it says in part four, massively generate reactive oxygen species and actually cause oxidative damage to existing cancer cells which they may or may not be able to handle by themselves, especially if glycolysis is attenuated and glucose uptake, which is the next key point, is decreased because you're now cutting off the PPP for cancer cells and attenuating its ability to create not only ATP through glycolysis and the Warburg effect, but also glutathione through the PPP. So pretty amazing preliminary kind of background information about melatonin and what the possibilities are using melatonin. So... I wanted to start to touch on melatonin's kind of classical mechanisms that have been elucidated. And I think this is a really neat slide because it shows the light and dark cycles, the decentralization, as Dr. Cruz would say. And obviously during the day, we have UVB that's present in sunlight. That is going to lead to the conversion of vitamin D from the cholesterol derivatives. And then that vitamin D is going to have both genomic and non-genomic activities. And we've talked about those in great detail in the past. We've talked about how vitamin D can increase antioxidant response via the clotho and through the NRF pathway. And then it's going to have non-genomic mitochondrial augmenting effects and protection effects. When light is inhibited, again, remember this is the classic pathway, 
thinking about the pineal release of melatonin, we see that melatonin through these two enzymes is going to be created and it's going to be secreted by the pineal gland. I think this is where we see that there is not any contraindication or contradiction between melatonin and vitamin D. We see that melatonin will increase vitamin D receptor transactivation. So it'll actually increase the expression and utilization of vitamin D receptor. It will have a secondary effect on clotho pathway, which is a major antioxidant pathway. And not only through the increase in vitamin D receptor and activity, but also a direct effect through these MT1 and MT2 receptors that you'll see when we come to more mechanistic videos about melatonin. And that will have also direct antioxidant response activity. And then it will have activity directly upon mitochondria and protecting mitochondria. And of course, as we've talked about in the recent past, mitochondria will actually produce its own melatonin, which creates its own kind of healthy feed forward mechanism to protect mitochondria, protect the genome, et cetera. And I want to end on this slide because it's pretty amazing how there is this kind of seesaw effect of regeneration on the body. First of all, I just want to preface as I'm going over, I, I just noticed this while I'm, while I'm reading it. Basically, the authors, I suspect, meant to put this as nuclear restorative in the day and mito restorative at night. And the reason I say that is because, as it says here, and I've seen this confirmed by the papers, is that there's increased substrate utilization, ATP production, which is going to increase reactive oxygen species to some degree, because that's what redox biology is. There's going to be increased repair of DNA. There's going to be a decrease in glutathione because glutathione is going to get utilized with all the redox chemistry that's going on when making ATP during the day. There's going to be increased catalase, increased glycolysis, metabolic rate. Obviously, your metabolism is higher during the day. And then there's going to be increased protein synthesis. And then at night, again, the seesaw, once you see it, you can't unsee it. <laughs> the seesaw is backwards, but at night, it's more mito-restorative when there's more melatonin available. There's mitofusion. We've talked about that being in the past, uncoupling proteins, mitochondrial remodeling. There's increasing of glutathione. There's increasing of fatty acid oxidation because likely you're going to be fasted and you're going to be, you know, utilizing stored fat stores. And there's going to be, because of the fasted state, because of activity on AMP kinase and activity on T3, et cetera, you're going to have more mitochondrial supercomplexes. Mitochondrial supercomplexes kind of go along with, you know, increased mitochondrial fusion. And you're going to have also mitochondrial fatty acid synthesis. So pretty cool story we've been painting so far about melatonin, about its creation using infrared, UV light, and potentially exercise basically in nearly unlimited quantities if you are able to be outside for the majority of the day. We've talked about melatonin and its circadian release at night and how that cycle looks. And now we're starting to see the importance of the day-night cycles, both for a nuclear or a nucleus, restorative, regenerative state, or at night, this mitochondrial restorative or regenerative state. And both of those night-day cycles are critically important because a lot of the deep science behind this has to do with these clock genes. And the clock genes have expression of certain proteins and biologic activities that require that 24-hour oscillation. And although we're not going to get too much into the circadian biology portion in this melatonin micro series, I do want to hammer home that the light-dark cycles are critically important to maintain your health and to reverse conditions related to mitochondrial dysfunction and nuclear genome dysfunction. I really look forward to the upcoming videos where we talk about a lot of the important mechanisms that melatonin exerts on mitochondria, on the nuclear genome, on the antioxidant response, and of course, upon cancer. If you like this video, please like it, share, subscribe, and until next time.